and still, after a very, very long week, we see him if we close our eyes. The spindly male figure, with what looks like a stick in his hand, unremarkable in his shorts and footy jersey and runners, blurred, lurching like a mechanical doll in the jerky CCTV footage, wheeling and careening through a tableau of everyday Australian life, Saturday afternoon at the shops. Locals are picking up their groceries. Families are going to the movies. Couples are enjoying a coffee. And amongst them, he crookedly jogs, with just his tortured mind and a blade, wearing, of all things, the official jersey of the Australian rugby league team, the Kangaroos, which, for over a century, has embodied all that is supposedly virtuous in the Antipodean male. Then early reports emerged about a serious incident at Westfield Bondi Junction. We're going to take you back to Bondi Junction where we have unfolding police operations underway there right now. There are very chaotic scenes here at Bondi Junction this evening. We don't know a lot about exactly what has happened yet, but what we do know is that police were called here just after 4pm after reports of multiple people having been stabbed inside Bondi Junction shopping centre. And within moments, the inexplicable horror of that day radiates outward from that shopping centre, perched on the spine of Oxford Street, across Sydney, and then the nation and immobilises us all. Well, tonight, news we hope we'd never have to deliver in this country. A mass killing at Sydney's biggest shopping centre. Terrified shoppers run for their lives from a man wielding a knife, stabbing people, including children. I've seen a baby with stab wounds. A baby? Yeah, there's a baby getting wheeled off by the ambulance. In the end, six dead. We cannot make sense of this. We cannot banish the thoughts that these poor people, mothers, daughters, wives, partners, had gone to Bondi Junction that afternoon and never thought in their wildest imaginings that they would not be coming home that night. That it was, in effect, their last day on earth. Six dead. Doing something we all do going about their Saturday afternoon business, oblivious they were about to meet death. Taken in an instant, because in that hour, in that minute, that second, a complete stranger's mind snapped in their vicinity. Days later, we are taken to the front yard of a simple house up on the range at Toowoomba, west of Brisbane, and witness another dimension to this catastrophe, the primal grief of the parents of the killer. I'm extremely sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. I, look, this is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. You, you're trying to give me to give you an intelligent conversation. I can't do it because I'm just devastated. I love yeah. my son. I made myself a servant to my son when I found out he had a mental illness. Mm. I became his servant. I did everything because I love that boy. For the entirety of this endless week, it's been impossible to avoid the aftershocks of tragedy, the ugly firework that suddenly explodes and shoots out projectiles in several different directions. Innocent people dead, families torn apart a nine-month-old child fighting for her life in hospital, traumatised witnesses, images of blood on polished marble, and the disturbed face of Joel Couchy, from non-entity to mass murderer. It's been hard to forget, too, the photograph of that heroic police inspector, Amy Scott, kneeling over the body of the monster she had just cut down saving countless lives. She, the literal embodiment of the New South Wales Police Force motto, punishment follows closely upon the heels of crime. Time in deep reflection can also see your mind running in search of symbols and broader meanings to make sense of it all. 
The killer's attack was an attack on egalitarian Australia itself, on what it means to be us. This, we told ourselves, is grotesquely un-Australian. This is not who we are. This sort of thing happens elsewhere, overseas, not here. But in the back of our minds, we wonder, has the world now caught up with us? There were heroes, of course, like the French tradie, Damien Gouraud, who will be forever known as Bollard Man. Someone who's not a citizen of this country uh, stood bravely at the top of those escalators and stopped this uh, perpetrator. For that, the Prime Minister says he deserves to be an Australian citizen. I say this to Damien Guero, who is dealing with uh, his visa applications, that you are welcome here, you are welcome to stay for as long as you like. Then there's the Westfield security guard, Mohammed Taha, who along with fellow guard Faraz Tahir, both from Pakistan, were the first to confront the killer on that day. Faraz lost his life. Mohammed miraculously survived and will be offered Australian residency for his courage. On Monday night, an already fragile Sydney learned of a knife attack at a church in the city's southwest. But Sydney did as Sydney does. It gets on with things. Today, Westfield will reopen its doors to the public. The space adorned with bouquets of flowers, black ribbons and signs. Together, we remember all those impacted here, Saturday, 13th April, 2024. New South Wales Premier Chris Minns yesterday summed up the reopening and the moment. It is an opportunity to reflect as a community on the last week and most importantly pay tribute to the six people that lost their lives as a result of that terrible and horrifying crime last Saturday. It's the first step in healing. As I said to a few people this morning, it's not back to normal for Sydney, but this is an opportunity to get some kind of grieving and to turn the page on what's been a very difficult period. Coming up, Sydney bravely tries to move on from this inconceivable tragedy. Don't forget, subscribers to The Australian get breaking news alerts direct to their phones, newsletters, special events and detailed analysis 24-7. Check us out at theaustralian.com.au. We'll be back after this break. In the wake of catastrophe, we seek or stumble across spidery tendrils of connection to horrible moments. We know people who know people who escaped that day with their lives or knew one of the victims. I have close friends who live just around the corner from Westfield Bondi Junction, and they've described the days following the tragedy as surreal, their neighbourhood eerie. All week, my friend said... I have found myself staring into space. This week, we have been a nation staring into space. Fiona Harari is a writer for the Weekend Australian magazine and has called Bondi Junction home for many years. She was in Westfield last Saturday, just moments before the attack. Well, I am not that big a shopper generally, but last Saturday I quite unusually had to go to buy something at Bondi Junction. And in the afternoon, I wandered down there and the shop that I needed to go to had actually been closed for some time. And so I made a split-second decision that I'd have to go to Westfield. Would I go into Maya or David Jones? I remember, you know, you sort of in retrospect think, wow, if I'd made another decision, where might I have been? But I decided I would go to Maya, looking for this baby present whilst I was in there, Someone calls out Fiona and a friend of mine, some old friends, their son and daughter-in-law and one-year-old baby were there. And I'd never met the baby, so of course I'm cooing over the baby for quite some time. We're chatting, they're looking to buy her clothes. 
I leave them, find the baby presents, pay for it. And I actually looked at my phone afterwards at three minutes past three, I messaged my partner to say I'm leaving Westfield. Minutes later, all hell broke loose. We'd got home and put on the television and I was monitoring everything on my phone. I actually just, even now I find it really hard to contemplate that, you know, and this happens every day, unfortunately, to other people. You just don't expect it's going to happen to an area you know well. That six people have died in an area that so many of us know so well. So it's almost like it's happening in your backyard where the flowers are now gathering (laughs) was where I stood to send my husband a message. You know, at three minutes past three last week, I'm just on my way back. Where should I meet you? And now that mall area right there is covered in flowers. I actually needed to go through Bondi Junction on Tuesday and I got to the area on foot and I have never known that place to be so still. There were people about, but there was no industry. There was none of the sort of chugging noises of industry that you don't really realise is always there in the background until they stop moving. There was this almost pall of stillness that had descended on this normally frenetic place. I walked into the mall to have a look at the flowers that had been left there and people were coming in waves who clearly had attachments to the people who'd been victims of this terrible circumstance. Fiona said, like so many of us, she had been reflecting on the tragedy throughout the week. It does really highlight the randomness of good and bad things that can happen in life, doesn't it? There were so many random elements to this. But I think what I have tried to do in the past few days when so many disturbing things have gone on in Sydney is really try to think about the random good things that happen as well. Because, you know, we had one person who's, you know, allegedly committed all these terrible crimes. And I suppose it's human nature to focus on that. But there were so many great people that came out of this as well. I don't think they could have predicted that they would behave in the way that they did. But thank goodness so many of them did what they did to protect so many people because I imagine the outcome could have been a lot worse. Fiona has already been back to Bondi Junction this week and witnessed a phenomenon my good friends in the neighbourhood also told me about. Heightened alertness to danger. As I was walking away from the flower memorial towards the train and bus station, I heard this man yelling, like really loud yelling, and I instantly recoiled And then he yelled again and all these other people recoiled. And I think it was someone in a gym with the windows opened who was just yelling at people to to lean in and lift those weights up. Mm. But it made me realise that so many people are on edge. People will, for all sorts of reasons, be back there. And it will probably feel the same place eventually for many people. But, of course, there's going to be this long-term memory for many who were caught up on the day And, of course, the people who never made it out. I mean, their families, I don't know how they'll begin to cope with what lies ahead. She said it was imperative that Bondi Junction was supported out of respect for everyone impacted by this tragedy. I think I would make myself go back there before I needed to go back and maybe buy some things I didn't need. I remember thinking this after the Lynch hostage scene as well. You know, did I need more chocolate? Who needs more chocolate? We can always do with more chocolate, but I, I probably didn't need more. But I remember going out of my way to go there just as a sign of respect and support. Mm. And I will probably, because, you know, we can't keep away. We've got to stick together. We, you've got to just keep going and hoping that tomorrow is better. It may be better. We want to believe it'll be better. Meanwhile, many of us remain here for a little while longer, inert, staring into space. Fiona Harari is a writer for the Weekend Australian magazine. Thanks for joining us on The Front this week. Our team is Claire Harvey, Kristen Amiot, Leah Samaglu, Josh Burton, Tiffany Dimack and me, Matthew Condon.